Hello, my name is Douglas Comer and I'm president of the United States National Committee of the International Council on Monuments and Sites. It is a very true pleasure to welcome everyone to this webinar on tribally driven bison restoration at the Waterson Glacier World Heritage Site. What we will hear for the next hour is relevant to the conservation and celebration of a central element in the culture of the Blackfoot Confederacy, one held in common with other Native Americans who once traveled freely across the plains. It should remind us that the human relationship with the natural world, the capacity to respect and even venerate our fellow creatures, defines who we are and determines what our future will be. We live today in a world of buildings and electric lights where the myriad of stars in the night sky are often not visible. So it's easy to forget that we are part of nature. Having forgotten that, we have come to a place where we have interfered with the natural processes to a point that endangers all of humanity and robs us of a proper sense of our place in the universe. This initiative is a source of celebration for the Blackfoot Confederacy, but it is as well therapy for this country and people all over the world. And with that, I would like to introduce Jeff Mao, Superintendent of Glacier National Park, that with Waterton Lakes National Park in Canada, forms the Waterton Glacier International Peace Park World Heritage Site. Thank you, and over to Jeff. Thank you, Douglas, uh, for those uh, great words. I mean, I think um, we're very excited to uh, be with all of you here today to uh, share with you some of the um, exciting things that we have uh, going on in this collaboration. Um, I think it's um, something that we're all very excited about. Um, and, and it, it's, I can tell you that as a, as a park manager, it's going to be truly transformational um, as this comes together. But first, I think, you know, I, we're, I, we'd like to take a moment and hear from Stephen Morris, our Director of Office of International Affairs, because Stephen brings some perspective about the value of world heritage status and what it can do for units of the National Park Service. And I just might add, I had the pleasure of traveling with uh, Steve um, in 2014 in Australia during the World Parks Congress. We were able to go hiking in the Blue Mountains together. And, uh, you know, I know Steve's got uh, quite a perspective on uh, that sort of international perspective of what these protected areas can do and how, how they can um, be of value to us, added value. So, Stephen. Great, thank you, Jeff. And um, thank you also to US ECOMOS and to uh, Doug Comer and Destry Jarvis for giving me the opportunity to address you today. Um, I won't be speaking long. I don't have any slides. Um, I'm really just here to give a brief overview. I won't be talking about bison restoration either. I will be giving you a brief overview of the World Heritage Program and mentioning a specific practical um, outcome that happened at Waterton Glacier about more than just over 10 years ago uh, that was a result of the designation, the World Heritage designation. So um, again, my office is the Office of International Affairs for the Park Service in Washington. We <clears throat> manage the U.S. World Heritage Program, which means that we oversee the nomination of U.S. sites to the World Heritage List. We uh, also report to the World Heritage Committee on the status of issues or possible threats to our uh, listed sites. And we, um, along with our colleagues in the State Department, we form the US delegation to the annual sessions of the World Heritage Committee. Um, just a little bit of background on the World Heritage Convention. It's actually an international treaty uh, with almost every country in the world now has signed on to it. <clears throat> the US was the first country to sign back in 1973. Um, we, we played a, a, a leading role in developing the convention. 
in the early uh, late 60s and early 70s. Um, currently, there are more than 1,100 sites on the World Heritage List around the world. Um, in the US, we have 24 sites, many of which are, most of which are national park units, including places like Glacier and the Grand Canyon and Independence Hall and the Statue of Liberty. We have a, I think we have a pretty good balance among the 24 between sites recognized globally for their cultural heritage values and sites that are recognized for their natural values. There's, I think there's slightly more natural value our natural world heritage sites. We do have one mixed world heritage site that's recognized for both cultural and natural values. That's the site in Hawaii, Papahana, Mokuakea Marine National Monument. Um, and several of our world heritage sites are recognized um, where they relate the stories and the accomplishments of native peoples. I wanna mention that um, given today's theme. Um, and those include places like Chaco Culture and Mesa Verde, Poverty Point in Louisiana, and also um, Taos Pueblo in New Mexico, which is um, managed by the tribal government. That's the only one of the 24 sites that's managed by a tribal government. Um, so we're, um, we're still nominating US sites. We're currently working on the nomination for the Hopewell Ceremonial um, Earthworks in Ohio. We've been working on that for the last several years with the stakeholders there, including Hopewell Culture National Historical Park and the Ohio History Connection. But there's also significant involvement from uh, tribal organizations in that nomination. We're hoping to be able to finish that up uh, this year by the end of the calendar, calendar year and submit it to the World Heritage Committee early next year. Um, now I want to turn just briefly to Waterton Glacier. It was inscribed on the World Heritage List in 1995. Um, I have to say it was not uh, it was not an easy path to getting listed. Um, in fact, uh, it turns out there were uh, three versions of the nomination um, over time, and uh, each time I guess it was improved a little bit. I read over the getting ready for speaking with you today, I read over the evaluation by the um, International Union for the Conservation of Nature. That's the organization that's um, the advisory body for natural sites for the World Heritage Committee. So they look at all the proposals and uh, make recommendations to the committee as to whether a, a proposed site meets the criteria. So they did three formal evaluations and, and apparently there was some disagreement within the IUCN World Heritage Panel as to whether Waterton Glacier was going to really had outstanding universal value, but they did conclude in the end that it did. Um, I thought it was interesting. They specifically mentioned the cultural importance of the International Peace Park um, uh, designation. And so that was a factor, but it was inscribed under two criteria out of the four uh, possible natural criteria. One was for scenic, natural beauty, scenic beauty, and the other one was for ongoing E ecological and biological um, processes of outstanding universal value. Um, and if anyone is interested in really uh, seeing um, a, a good description of the outstanding universal value, I recommend that you visit the um, World Heritage Center's webpage. They have a brief synthesis of, of the criteria and a description. So I said it was not an easy path to inscription, and um, I think that's true, but I definitely think it was worth the effort. Um, because a dozen years after the listing, uh, there began to be um, uh, issues that arose in regard to energy development in the Canadian Flathead uh, Valley, and um, many, many groups began to be concerned about that. I should mention that the Flathead River, uh, which flows from Canada into the United States, forms the western boundary of Glacier National Park. It's a pristine river. Um, so the energy proposed energy development was definitely a matter of concern uh, and um, a number of environmental groups and NGOs on both sides of the border uh, decided to pursue this with the World Heritage Committee and they petitioned the committee to uh, place uh, Waterton Glacier on the list of World Heritage in danger. This happened in 2007, 2008, thereabouts. Um, 
In the following year, the committee decided to authorize uh, what's known as a reactive monitoring mission. Uh, which essentially was an inspection. So they sent a representative, the director of the World Heritage Center and a representative from IUCN um, to, to uh, Montana and to Alberta and British Columbia. They spent the better part of a week there in September, 2009, meeting with, in, with folks, meeting with officials, meeting with uh, community members and um, basically assessing what, what the impact would be if the energy developments were allowed to go forward in the Flathead Valley. Um, their report was issued in, the, in early 2010. It happened that uh, British Columbia was hosting the Winter Olympics at that time in Vancouver, so they were particularly sensitive uh, to uh, uh, international, um, the international spotlight being shown on them. Um, and the, the, the mission's report was very clear and emphatic that uh, development, energy development in the Flathead would have devastating impacts on the World Heritage Site. And there was no, there was no compromise, there was no way to mitigate it. So having that, that strong statement from the World Heritage um, perspective, I think really had a major impact. And very shortly thereafter, it was announced that the Governor of Montana and the Premier of British Columbia had agreed to uh, prohibit any energy development in the Flathead, either in Canada or in the US. And so um, I think the reason this is worth uh, mentioning and recalling is that uh, it shows that you know, World Heritage is a lot more than just an honorific designation. It really does have protective value and it, it's an important tool for conservation. So I think we should all just keep that in mind um, so I think with that, I'll turn it back to Jeff and uh, look forward to hearing the rest of the presentations. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for uh, sharing that history. Um, you know, it's one that I am certainly aware of as, as the superintendent, but uh, it was certainly before my time. And it's always good, I think, for me to understand some of those uh, battles and efforts and initiatives that my predecessors took on and how I stand on their shoulders today. And, and so that, that was great. Um, as your moderator today, or for the panel that's uh, upcoming, I, what I'd like to do is do a, a short orientation to the landscape that Steve was just talking about. Um, we're talking about the crown of the continent landscape that we're, uh, that's shown here on the map and give you a reference to where it is in North America. Uh, Steve was just talking about the headwaters of the Flathead, which is in this area. This crown of the continent landscape, and I've also sort of um, added uh, Mistakis, which is the Blackfeet name for, um, uh, well, it translates to, to backbone of the world, uh, which, you know, really is represented here uh, in this crown of the continent landscape. But this larger land landscape around us is about 11 million acres in size, which is about 4.4 4 4 million hectares in size. It's a pretty sizable area. Much of it is under conservation. And um, what's really unique about this landscape is for such a large area that there's only three roads that transect this landscape. So it really does offer uh, incredible opportunities for wildlife connectivity, for in, in, intact ecosystems. And uh, this crown of the continent landscape is one where uh, we have active management taking place uh, on that. Um, it's also uh, geographically one of the narrowest sections of the Rocky Mountain, the Rocky Mountains, which stretch from Mexico all the way to Alaska. Um, and in fact, um, in this area, which is part of Glacier National Park, we have the sort of easternmost extent of Pacific Coastal Northwest, Pacific Northwest Coastal Rainforest. And just a few miles over the divide, you come to the um, prairies of the grasslands of the prairie areas, um, which ex of course extend for uh, almost a thousand miles uh, to the east. So it's a really uh, unique situation uh, from an ecosystem perspective because it brings together uh, in very close proximity some unusual um, uh, geographies. Um, 
there's a group that of uh, managers like myself and Sal, who will be on with us uh, in a moment. He's the superintendent of Waterston Lakes National Park. Um, but we work together on how we manage this uh, landscape for some of those conservation values, cultural values as well. Um, we like to say that at the heart of the crown of the continent landscape uh, is Waterton Glacier International Peace Park. And um, together, uh, Waterton Glacier International Peace Park was first established in 1932 by um, simultaneous acts of the Canadian Parliament and the US Congress, which is a hard thing to imagine these days happening. Um, Likewise, in uh, I believe it was 1976 that uh, um, UNESCO ga uh, ga uh, um, presented the uh, Man in the Biosphere, the Biosphere Reserve for Waterton Glacier. Um, as Steve mentioned in 1995, uh, World Heritage designation for Waterton Glacier International Peace Park uh, was presented and actually in 2017, uh, Waterton and Glacier together became the world's first transboundary international dark sky reserve. And, you know, it's, it's, that's representative of how we're working together, how we try to work seamlessly across this international border on how we manage our parks as part of the International Peace Park. So what we'll be discussing today and, and what's so exciting is, is how we are working with our um, Native partners, our indigenous partners uh, to the east on a very transformational initiative to bring uh, bison, wild free ranging bison back to this shared landscape, a uh, species that had not been free ranging for well over a hundred years. And um, so to do that, we will hear from um, Helen and Sheldon, two tribal members from the Blackfeet. We will hear from uh, Christina Momoroni, who is with the Wildlife Conservation Society and, and, how, and the important role that they play in uh, uh, as facilitating this ongoing relationship. And Sal Rashid, my counterpart um, at Waterston Lakes National Park, will um, talk about uh, some of the activities that's going uh, north of the border. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Helen and Sheldon to uh, introduce themselves. And also, I think it's important that we think about and, and uh, approach this um, presentation from a traditional perspective. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Helen and Sheldon. Good morning. Um, my name is Helen Ogier Carlson. Okay, Nadanaku, Mustakiotas. My Indian name is Mountain Horse, and my English name is Sheldon Carlson. We just want to thank um, everyone for inviting us to to share our experience and and some of our our background. Um, we're both beaver bundle holders and painted lodge owners. Um, here in Amskapi Bigani, the Southern Bigani. Um, we're part of the Blackfoot Confederacy, which entails our, our tribes up north, um, the Siksika, the Gainai, and the, the Northern Abatso Bigani. So um, before we start off the presentation, um, We've been asked to say a prayer and and offer a song. Um, so I'll start the prayer and then the song we're going to share is is a beaver bundle song um, for safety, which um, includes the the buffalo. So I'll start the prayer. I O is the bad to be open. I o na pi na tu si I o gipi da ki ko komiki sum spumokit spumokin na ne dokokit I o bitsawatis manigapi spumokit spumokin na ne dokokit I o kistaki mo pistan e kuiniman spumokit spumokin na ne dokokit Oki bonakako kan 
Spumokit, Spumokin Nana Doko Git. Gitsi, Sixi Mat Stopin Nan, Gimatokin Nan, Nistuna Upukasin. Ispamokin Nan Gi, Astamat Stokin Nan, Suxi Beta Bisini. Gokin Nan, Misami Beta Bisin, Gi Gamotani. So um, I work at the Blackfeet Community College. I've been there for 20 years. I co-founded the Native Science Field Center. Um, I also am the Title III Director currently in administration, but my um, work that I've done has has really led a lot into, again, exploring my um, journey in life. I never grew up with, with the language or the culture, but I grew up with the land. My family is from Mission, which is the Eastern, down east of to Medicine on the, on the Tomedicin River. And our ranch out there, my great great grandfather was Eli um, Gardapi. And he was good friends with um, James Willard Schultz. And, and they um, made a deal. And that's how we ended up, our family ranch ended up being down on Tomedicin. Um, also, his son, Francis um, Gardapi, Francis X Gardapi, he was the first Native American park ranger. Um, so the land has always really been uh, um, essential in our family. I know hearing about my grandfather, he was one of the last ones who went on the, the last buffalo hunt that was here in, in Blackfoot country in the late 1880s. And he talks about how the herd at that time um, was very small and they had to travel a long way to, to find them. And they realized um, during that hunt, you know, how scarce the buffalo were in, in and that they needed to take some actions to, um, to really look at going forward, how they were gonna save, save the species and so, and save the relationship. And so um, they, they met with other um, chiefs and I, do, I did come across a document where Dick Sanderville writes about um, five chiefs working with um, the Salish and Kootenai tribe to get seven calves from the east side of the mountains over to the west side um, to ensure that that those animals would be um, taken care of and and that that lineage would continue on and so Moving forward to my generation, like I said, I you know I never grew up with with the language, but I did grow up just exploring and being out on the land, whether it was in the mountains, going with my family to camp and to to fish and to you know enjoy the park, or whether it was being out you know, on the, the plains or in, in the river bottoms, just enjoying our time out and learning about um, what my grandma would teach us about, you know, the plants and, and different things that I never really knew were, were the traditional knowledge, but I just figured it was her knowledge of, of how we live in this place. And so, I mean, it, 
Yeah. As I grew up, I, I knew, you know, we didn't see the buffalo physically, but I, we all knew, like we were always told, be proud of who you are. And, and we, we knew like Bita, the eagle, and Ini, the buffalo, we knew that these species were, were very important and that we could call on them. Um, even though we might not physically see them, especially the buffalo. And I know the tribe, they had a, a herd when I was little that would just kind of show up. And it was so just amazing to wake up one morning and out of the blue, you see a herd of buffalo. Um, and it didn't happen often. But when it did, it was really, really special. And I remember we would just like watch them for hours and and just enjoy the moment. Um, and so moving forward to you know the work that we're doing with with the park and the partnerships that we formed through the tribal college, we really are the neutral hub in the community um, providing education to the youth and to our tribal college students, the adult education, you know, working with our tribal government and our tribal resource management departments um, and working with the Confederacy. Um, it's been, you know, through my career, um, just a real, pleasure to, to be able to do projects like the ENI initiative, grassroots movements um, that really bring us together and unite us. Um, so back in 2008, 2009, we started to have um, elder dialogues and Leroy Little Bear, Keith Ani, Urban Carlson, Terry Tatsy, Paulette Fox. Um, they were kind of the, the, ma the masterminds behind bringing everybody together and just having conversation about what, what we need to do in order to bring Ini back home, in order to, to live a healthy relationship together and and we know it's instilled in us that we're always thankful for for what the buffalo has given us our food our shelter you know even the health of the land and so during these dialogues the elders really um pushed us they motivated us they encouraged us and and we always had a um empty chair for Ini. He was always there in spirit and, and he would ask us, what are you going to do? How, how are you going to um, make a home for me? And, and he would tell us, I never left you. It's you who left me. And so it was, it was really a time when we would gather and, and have these deep conversations and, and the elders tell us, you know, this is what the relationship is. This is what has been um, through, through our process. This is what has changed. And so anyhow, we, um, move forward with just really being able to to come together and set goals and and really carry that responsibility that the elders put in front of us to say now it's time to take action we um came up with the notion that we can still do treaty so we started the buffalo treaty and we went to the tribes um around us and we asked them, you know, would you be willing to sign an agreement and treaty? Our traditional way, 
um, to agree that we all support and in, in reintroducing bison to the landscape and back to, to Blackfeet territory. So um, it's been a, a journey that, you know, has been so meaningful to so many people. And I look back and, and really honor those elders who are now not with us, but we still hear their voices and their encouragement to try hard, igakima, try hard and, and, and make a, a good home for our relatives. Hello. <clears throat> so I'd like to talk about like some of the stuff because I am from Tomedicin, Little Badger in Tomedicin where I grew up all since I was small. And I remember times when I'd get up early in the morning in the, in the 70s and kind of like middle of the 70s and I would wake up and there would be buffalo out on the side hills and over by the barn, you know, and they just kind of show up, you know, and I thought that was pretty cool, you know. So as life went on and stuff like that, I just kind of like um, always thought about, you know, because we were young one time, we saddled up horses and we were all young, went up on top of the hill to see what kind of I don't know, Drennan would get out of chasing buffalo, you know, on horseback, bareback, because it was just, you know, we're Indians, you know, and we're, so we did it. <clears throat> so then later on down the road, and uh, I came home from construction, I was kind of getting burnt out. So I came home and I went to the tribe and I was trying to find work with them and all that. And one morning they called me, they told me, come down, we've got a job for you if you want it. So then uh, Mark and Irvin were sitting there and they said, what do you want to take care of Buffalo? And I says, yeah, sure, it's a job. So I got with the Buffalo program and started out, I was kind of like, didn't really know, but it took a while to really figure the animal out, animal out by on my own and stuff like that. Cause nobody really, really, I didn't, I wasn't around them, I guess I'm saying, to really know the animal itself, you know, just when we see them once in a while. But so there's days I would sit out there all day and watch and watch, watch your behavior, watch how they moved around and all that. And, and then so as life went on, I start figuring them out, you know, that, you know, they're just an animal. If you just leave them alone, they're not going to like run you over, chase you or anything like that. You know, they just kind of respect the animal itself. So I learned the hard way. I kind of got initiated to them, kind of got run over a couple of times. But so as time went on, we start driving them to the summer pasture up by East Glacier there and um, to the summer pasture. And we did it on four wheelers. And, you know, that was really pushing them hard. So I start really looking at like asking a tribe if I can just slow it down and take our time and move them because we had you know land tribal land in between all the way up to the um summer pasture and so we start doing it they, they okayed it we did it on horseback as we did it we set up camp for the night we made sure we rode the field make sure they had water and that was the main part that i really looked at was make sure they have water in that field so then We'd get bed down and everybody would start putting up their lodges and all that and getting ready for, you know, to, to sleep. But we didn't sleep. We stayed up all half of the night just laughing at one another who got chased or who was stuff like that during this drive, you know, and it was really a cool thing, you know. Going to bed at five in the morning and getting up at seven and tearing the lodges down and then we start gathering the buffalo and we start moving west and we just took them slow. Because the respect what I had was for the older ones, I called them like my grandmas, and then for the babies that was born that spring, because it was hard on them. So that's why we, we, we did them on horses, so it slowed everything down. And then we started getting bigger to where we started inviting people to come experience it. And it took us three days to do 27 miles. But you know what? Our animals weren't hurt, nothing. Everybody was you know not left behind and all that. And a lot of our old people, my aunts and uncles and grandmas and grandpas, enjoyed that. They enjoyed that when we had vehicles and we had volunteers bring their pickups out and follow. 
and we would have big lunches and big suppers and all that. And you just hear them tell stories about their time, you know, of just the, the small herds way back in the days and stuff like that, you know. But now they were so happy that we have buffalo and that we did this drive and, you know. So it was it was a good thing, you know. There was one thing I really learned it was just uh, having that respect for the animal. And then we needed the land. So one day I was telling Irvin, they almost got into the uh, Lewis and Clark, I think that's just south of East Glacier there in, uh, by the Dog and Lake one day and they were trying to head back up into the timber and to the park side. So I went up there on horseback and I got a few of my friends volunteer to help me push them back out. But we just, we just stayed there, as soon as we seen them, they were just like totally just laying, kick back and all that, and the calves were running around and all that, you know, and I was thinking, man, that'd be cool if we could get them buffalo up in the, up in the Cedar Strip, huh? That was it, okay. Oh, okay, so anyways, I'm getting close to where I get a, uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, so we started working hard, and then when I started meeting different people and all that, and then there was times when I met Jeff Mao, I always really wanted to, uh, you know, get the buffalo up to the Cedar Strip, you know. But yeah, that was a good story. That was my part of my, you know, experience and good. Jeff? Well, thanks, Helen and Sheldon, um, for sharing with us. Um, I think that sort of brings that deeper meaning to uh, the work that we're doing, uh, the difference it makes uh, to all of you, both spiritually and culturally. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Christina Momoroni, who is the uh, regional director for the Rocky Mountain region of the Wildlife Conservation Society. And, and Keith Ani's name had come up before he was uh, with WCS. Uh, and he has been, you know, for me anyway, just uh, the glue, the person that uh, helps facilitate and keeps us together in this collaboration. Christina's inherited that, but I think Christina's bringing um, some terrific new vision as we look at sort of the, uh, yeah, the next iteration of, of moving this initiative forward. So with that, Christina. Thank you so much, Jeff. And thank you, Helen and Sheldon, for the prayer and the blessing and the song and those fantastic stories. I'm fully in Blackfeet country right now, so it's hard to come back and deal with the computer screens. <laughs> but thank you for sharing that. So, Oki, Nistokowak, Niso Nitanko, Isaki. So I, my name in Blackfoot, I was honored this summer with a Blackfoot name and it is Wolverine Woman. My English name is Christina Mormaruni. And as Jeff said, I'm the regional director for the Wildlife Conservation Society and for our Rocky Mountain program. On my mother's side, I'm Métis from Canada. And on my father's, I'm Sardinian. Um, so I come from many worlds and live between many worlds. Um, and so what I've been asked to present to all of you today is a couple of things. To give you a bit of an overview of, you know, who is the Wildlife Conservation Society? Who is the Rocky Mountain Regional Program? Why do we exist? What do we do? How do we do it? And then to take the conversation into some of the work I'm most passionate about and most proud of, which is our EMI initiative and the deep decadal um, partnership and relationship we have with the Blackfoot Confederacy to bring EME back to its homeland. Um, so with that, I am going to share my screen. And I live in Tewa lands in Northern New Mexico, very rural. Um, and so oftentimes I don't have fantastic internet. So I think what I'm gonna do is share my screen and then turn off my video so that we don't have any issues. So let me know if there's any issues. Let's chat here. Um, so as I said, I'd love to just give you a deep and quick history of WCS um, and our ENI initiative, which is a part of a larger initiative that we've created um, centered in really developing a new conservation paradigm for the 21st century. 
um, one that really draws on Indigenous-led conservation visions, knowledge, uh, wisdom, and thinking about how we do conservation differently in these times. And so with that, um, who is WCF? So we're a global, global conservation organization. We're based out of the Bronx Zoo in New York. Um, and we exist to save wildlife and wild places. And we do that through science, conservation, education, and inspiring people to value nature. And this next slide here gives you a, a sense of our global scope. Um, we work in 60 countries. And the way in which we organize ourselves is through a regional lens, so these regional programs. And we have 14 of those. And as I mentioned, the Rocky Mountains, which I lead, is one of those programs. And Buffalo, um, when I flip back and forth between bison and buffalo, when I talk about um, them as my relations, I use buffalo. And when I start to get into my conservation speak, I, I use bison. So you will see me flipping back and forth and I often get asked questions about why I do that. It is very unconscious, um, but bison is very much at the heart of WCS's origin story. And I've long since taking this role, really thought about what it must have been like to live with 30 million buffalo. And this is the only image that I've ever found that starts to represent what that must have felt like. Um, a, clearly a creative rendition, but, but nonetheless, I think really contemplating that as we think about the conservation of these animals moving forward, I think is really important. And how having that many beings that we shared our lives with, how did that shape us as humans, as culture, as society? And unfortunately, we all know this story a little too well, um, but again, I, I hold it up as a reminder um, of why we do what we do and why we have to, uh, to use, uh, and I'm gonna butcher it, but to use your words, Helen, why we need to try hard, um, it's stunning to think that we were killing 4,000 4, animals a day and that within a hundred years, we took those incredible herds from 30 million or more to just 500. And the fact that we were able to put this incredible animal on the verge of extinction in such a short time still stunned me to this day. And I think another reason this story is so important as we think about conservation and think about our work in the first century is, yes, this was a huge ecological transgression, but I would argue that even more significantly, it was a horrific act of cultural genocide. And so if we think about conservation moving forward with that kind of history in North America, maybe what we really need to be thinking about is a whole new paradigm, one that really does braid a recognition that cultural integrity and ecological integrity are in an intimate embrace. And we, we can't just think about one or the other. And so certainly in terms of WCS and the Rocky Mountain Program, when we think about bison conservation and restoration across the continent, we think about it through a biocultural lens. And we very much see our conservation work as work that provides a pathway to both equity and justice um, in this country, in this continent. So when the founders of WCS realized that, that the extermination of the American bison was hovering on the horizon, they, they stepped up, they leaned in. Um, and with a few other significant um, conservation leaders at the time, they decided they were gonna sort of begin the first rewilding experiment, if you will. And in 1907, we shipped 15 Bronx Zoo Buffalo um, to the Wichita Mountains in Oklahoma and started this, uh, something that really continues in my program today, this vision um, and action of rewilding the Rockies. And we very much continue that work. Um, we do in, um, obviously in the Northern Rockies, but throughout our landscapes, uh, which this map here represents. So we think about rewilding um, from the Northern Rockies to the Southwest borderlands and everywhere in between. And we think about it through the lens of species, um, most often through species that are both ecological and cultural keystones like bison or beaver, um, but also we think about it through the lens of important ecosystems like grasslands, like riparian systems. And when I first took over this position about, oh gosh, pretty coming close on three years now, we really went through kind of a reimagining exercise. You know, who did we want to be? Why did we exist? And this slide here really quickly tried to encapsulate that theory of change, if you will. 
So our why is we protect, reconnect, and rewild priority landscapes in the Rockies. We do that, and we have a long history of focusing on connectivity. So we continue to think about how we can catalyze connectivity so we can achieve conservation at a scale that makes sense from an ecological perspective, from a cultural perspective. I think one important thing for us to note here is that while our history is very much grounded in ecological connectivity and identifying those barriers and obstacles to ecological connectivity and removing them, since I've taken over, we think, we think very deeply about socio-political connectivity as well as cultural connectivity. Again, recognizing that all of those really need to go hand in hand if we are going to connect landscapes, reconnect landscapes, and protect the integrity of those. And again, big changes in what we've had in our toolbox, our how, so to speak. Um, this kind of gives you a flavor of the, the breadth of tools and tactics that we um, direct to this large vision. A couple things to note here that are really new for us. Uh, we've always been a science-based conservation organization. Um, since taking on this role, what I've really promoted and worked to do is to think about science much more broadly. So to think about science across this spectrum of where we're gonna gather new data all the way to the other end of that spectrum, how do we translate data so it really inspires people, so it drives action, so it informs policy. In addition to that, it just deep recognition that Western science isn't the only way of knowing the world. And so our job is to figure out how we can braid different knowledge systems. How can we bring together Western science, indigenous science, cultural knowledge, not only in framing our research question, but also informing our methodologies and how those touch down on the ground. Um, and then on the other end of this um, sort of continuum here, really new for us, but super exciting and super fun, I have to say, is really bringing storytelling um, in front and center and really figuring out how do we build a movement um, that embraces these conservation goals that we have and certainly is willing to stand behind the conservation gains that we're able to secure over time. And so the EMI initiative is something, um, you know, Helen and, and Jeff both spoke to the Sheldon as well. It's something that we have been engaged with for a very, very long time. You know, um, as I mentioned, bison are the heart of WCS's 125 year old origin story. They also are the heart of our relationship with the Blackfoot Confederacies and the lands that make up the Confederacy's traditional territory. Um, you know, as the story was told to me, Helen really shared it so beautifully. There was a series of dialogues um, that were co-created with the elders' voices and visions and knowledge front and center. Um, and those really emerged out of a shared commitment to protecting this large landscape that you see here. So the elders were really interested in a conversation about how Eni could come back to this homeland. WCS was really interested in Eni in general, but we were looking for a place in which we could work differently. Um, a highly uh, matrix landscape, so being able to work across multiple jurisdictions, a landscape of high ecological and cultural integrity, a place that we could really sort of begin to roll out a new conservation paradigm, one that was holistic and systemic in its frame, was community informed, um, indigenous led, and grounded in relationship and partnership. And as a, at the same time that Keith Ani, uh, my mentor, elder, uh, predecessor, was thinking about these things, he was approached um, by some of the leaders that Helen referred to from, uh, from across the Confederacy. So Leroy Little Bear, Paulette Fox, Amethyst Newrider, um, a pretty incredible group of people. And they too were thinking about how do we bring Buffalo home? How do we start these conversations? And out of those dialogues that Helen detailed, what came was the EME initiative. And at that time, um, there was three core goals that the elders had guided um, this, these various uh, leaders to take on board to embody in the EME initiative. And those three goals were in connecting youth to EME, to Buffalo, uh, to dissolve boundaries of all kinds, um, real and metaphorical, and to heal the land and people through Buffalo. And so the youth component of that involved everything from internships to school programs, cultural exchanges. Um, the boundaries were 
was centered in a couple of different things. Um, there was a WCS facilitated agency working group, which probably many of you have participated in. We're doing a 2.0 on that one and kicking off a new framing for that conversation. In fact, a new name as well. As has been pointed out that the agency always <laughs> lands a little differently depending on the audience. And those working groups were and will continue to be places of bringing um, different perspectives, responsibilities, worldviews together and thinking about how we can facilitate as a collaborative, the free reign in this homeland, in these landscapes once again. Um, and then the other sort of core goal, the healing goal, um, again, had a youth component. Um, it had um, ceremony and cultural revitalization, community events. So that was sort of 1.0, if you will. And over the course of the last year, many of the people that Helen mentioned um, and myself and, and some of the WCS Rocky team have been holding monthly meetings, thinking about um, what do we wanna do with the ENI initiative moving forward? Um, and about a year ago, actually my last trip before COVID was Bakfi territory, to Amskapi Pakani, and I had several conversations with folks and really just posed the question, you know, from where I sit, um, I can see that there's many people who keep talking about a, a bigger, bolder EME initiative. How do we want to kick that off? And so we kicked that off first in person with some conversation, and then we had to go virtual. And I've been pleasantly surprised that we have maintained that dialogue. And this is sort of what we've come up with as kind of a systemic vision or a strategic framework for the ENI initiative uh, 2.0. So again, a recognition that youth and ENI are at the center of everything that we do, um, but that we need to think creatively about how we bring these different pathways um, into, the, into the mix as we think about getting ENI back on the land. Um, in, a, in a big, big, bold vision and scale. Um, and so this here is just a, a really quick representation of sort of a high level work plan that we've created. Um, and so everything from really designing a biocultural framework uh, for developing research priorities um, to the creation of an indigenous scholars hub, which again is recognizing the importance of youth and how can we support youth in getting involved in not only bison conservation, but the conservation of many species um, and the larger landscape. And how can they be supported through mentorship programs, both from a Western science perspective, as well as from a cultural perspective and an elder support. And then programming for youth, so horsemanship, Horses, obviously, as, as Sheldon pointed out, are so inextricably interconnected culturally with EME. So we're working on developing some horsemanship camps. Um, some of it will be virtual, some of it hopefully in, in real. Um, the internship programs will continue. Again, the importance of storytelling and culture and making sure that the connections between youth and elder and story and culture are as strong as possible. And how can we get those digital stories out to young people across Indian country, recognizing that EME is not just a regionally significant model, um, but it's a nationally significant model. If not, I would argue a globally significant model of how we can connect with the land, how we can protect the land and how we can bring culture in as a force for conservation. And so really thinking about how we can get the young people who are so much savvier than I in storytelling digitally to help do that. And then Helen mentioned the Buffalo Treaty. And that really is um, a foundation for what we call EME diplomacy, which is building again sort of this larger awareness and circles of support for things like the EME initiative across the Confederacy, but also across Indian country. Um, and how can we support other nations who want to bring Buffalo home? And how can we help support um, the design, development, implementation of land-based restoration projects? Um, and I will leave you with this, if I can get this to play, as I said, <laughs> not super technically savvy, um, but this is up in um, Skopi Pakani. Um, this is the Black Deep Buffalo herd and just such a beautiful reminder of why this landscape is so globally significant and why these beings are such incredible um, 
icons, keystones, and pathways to protecting this landscape. So thank you so much um, for this opportunity. I really appreciate it and happy to take questions during the Q&A. Thank you, Christina. That was that was terrific. And I, I think you really sort of demonstrated why we need partners like WCS who can who can help organize us, you know, that uh, working with the tribe and their perspective and their interest and and agencies like the National Park Service and the state of Montana and otherwise, I, I you know, I, I think it's vitally important uh, that we have partners like WCS if we're going to move that forward. Um, right now, we're going to turn to north of the border, my counterpart at Waterton Glacier International Peace Park. Salman Rashid is the, the unit superintendent of Waterton Lakes National Park. And he's going to talk about sort of his work with um, the, uh, the, the tribe that's part of the Blackfoot Confederacy um, just north of the border. So Sal, if you would take it away. Great, thank you. I always have to check the unmute in the video with, with uh, today's day and age. Um, well, it's a real pleasure to be here, folks. As Jeff mentioned, my name is uh, Saul Rashid. I'm the field unit superintendent for Waterton Lakes National Park. And I think the first thing I'll do is try to share my screen here so we can um, see here. Oops, that's not what I, there we go. Can someone just give me a signal check that you can see my screen? Looks great. Great, thanks. Well, as I said, it's a real pleasure to be here. Okay, uh, my my um, name is Saul Rashid, as I said, uh, field unit superintendent for Waterton. Um, my Blackfoot name is still standing, Nitepoi, and uh, it's a real honor to have a, a Blackfoot name um, in in traditional Blackfoot territory. Um, I I will be very brief in my comments because I think um, if you're an attendee to this uh, meeting, you've already sort of receive the both the spiritual and the the uh, traditional framework for what we are trying to do here and um, really what i'm going to talk about is some very very recent uh, implementation activities that have happened in uh, canada and that we're incredibly proud of um, so i'll just start uh, by letting you know that um, some of the material that Jeff uh, Jeff has already covered. Uh, we're a, a national park in the Canadian National Park System. We're the fourth oldest national park and we're a very small player. We're surrounded by um, reserve land. We're surrounded by two provinces and um, the United States south of us. So we have to work with our partners. We cannot do it alone. Our small geography does not allow us to you know, retain large uh, free-ranging uh, animals across our across our landscape. We're part of the traditional Nitsisapi uh, territory, um, and as Jeff mentioned, um, you know a very significant um, uh, little part of the world. Uh, for those of you that don't know, we border the BC border, the U.S. border, are in are in the province of Alberta, and we're part of the International Glacier Peace Park. Uh, we are part of the biosphere reserve, we're part of a world heritage site, and most recently we have uh, achieved an international dark sky designation with our, with our partners in Glacier National Park. So a real, I always uh, uh, liken Waterton, Waterton to a little crucible. Um, if we can get it right in Waterton uh, with our land base, we can get it right elsewhere. Um, and it really necessitates working with uh, and collaborating with our partners. Um, I'm going to share with you two events that have happened uh, very recently that are, uh, you know, uh, based Sal, I think we lost your audio. They recognized Eni as a keystone animal and they acknowledged um, management plans and business plans to reintroduce a cultural herd 
um, as part of a larger holistic plan. And I, and I bring that up simply because it's important to have a sort of that recognition from uh, chief and council to acknowledge uh, these rematriations. Otherwise, um, you know, the, the support really isn't there in the local community and, and, and routing it through the chief and council was, was really important uh, to us. So that was in uh, 2020. There was a lot of heavy lifting and hard work before then to make this happen. Uh, the band council resolution, the other important part was they set aside uh, around 3000 acres um, uh, of reserve land for this initiative. And there's potential for more reserve land to be set aside for this initiative. And again, really important that that chief and council were heavily involved in, uh, in doing this. So on uh, February 12th, I'll just cut to the chase, um, 40 uh, bison were uh, transported down from Elk Island National Park. So some of you have probably heard of Elk Island National Park in Alberta, just uh, a, a little bit uh, east of Edmonton, Alberta. And uh, that really is a source population for many of our Plains bison because they're disease free and, and uh, they're transported uh, all over the world. We, ha we transport animals from Elk Island all the way to Russia. Uh, Poundmaker Cree Nation just received some bison earlier this year. Um, and, and certainly the Blackfoot and Blackfeet nations have benefited from uh, transplants from Elk Island. So on February 12th, uh, 40 animals were transported down to uh, the Kainai Reserve. I'm happy to report that it went uh, really well. Uh, you know, when you're doing these sort of transports and large scale movements of big animals like this, there's always an element of risk involved. And, and I'm happy to say that um, the, the transport went well and the bison are now uh, settled in their handling uh, uh, corral and will soon be released to uh, the larger uh, larger reserve paddock. So that happened on uh, February 12th. And then um, on February 19th, which was really just last Friday, um, uh, Waterton Lakes National Park received our uh, demonstration heard back again. So some of you will know that in 2017, Waterton Lakes National Park uh, suffered from a very large catastrophic wildfire. Uh, we've always had, the park has always had a small demonstration herd. We had to remove that demonstration herd for safety reasons. And um, for the past uh, two, three years, we've not had bison in our national park. And so uh, uh, last Friday, uh, we also received um, uh, six animals uh, back onto our national park lands. The, uh, we had elders from uh, the entire Confederacy, Sitsika, Pikani, Kainai there, and they blessed the land before the arrival of the bison. Uh, it was an incredibly special and symbolic uh, event. Um, as Sheldon mentioned, there were good stories and there were good, lots of laughter, and, and it was also a very spiritual, a spiritual moment as well before the bison arrived. Uh, and um, our, our collaboration with the Blackfoot Confederacy is, is uh, really important to us. And one of the key parts that I was really proud of is that uh, the, talk, the title of this talk is, is um, traditional led. Uh, and, and that's exactly what this was. Um, the, the Kainai went to Elk Island and brought back bison to their lands. And in fact, the following week, the Kainai went on our behalf up to Elk Island and brought back bison for us, for the national park. And so really they were leading uh, and we were sort of helping from behind on this whole initiative. And it was um, people that have been mentioned already, Leori Little Bear and Fox and others who were really um, pushing us along and, and encouraging us to get uh, these animals back on the lot the landscape. So just a few uh, quick pictures of the actual reintroduction because of COVID we have Uh, the bison arrived, the release uh, went smoothly. Um, we had some video uh, uh, there and there's a documentary that's being made about this release, both from the Kainai side and from the Parks Canada side. Um, 
uh, six animals who were probably very surprised to see mountains because that's the first time they've seen mountains probably in their lives. Um, Elk Island's a fairly flat park. Uh, it's prairie. And so uh, uh, returning these bison back to native fescue grassland was um, and, a, and a mountain landscape was was really important. One thing I'll add before I close is, is that um, one of the benefits of the Kenau fire was that it exposed many archaeological sites uh, that we did not know about in Waterston Lakes National Park. And, and part of those archaeological finds have shown that bison ro roamed freely uh, within our park and in the area. And, and this is something that we all knew already uh, through our uh, Indigenous knowledge, but um, it was reaffirmed by some of the digs. And so to have bison back on the landscape just sort of closes that circle very nicely and <clears throat> excuse me, reaffirms, um, you know, some of the, the presence of these animals um, historically over, over many, many generations. And then, you know, uh, I'm happy to report that uh, the bison continue to uh, um, uh, wander in their winter paddock. Our plan is that they'll reside there um, during the course of the winter. And then we have another summer paddock that will move them over to um, to allow some uh, public viewing and and just some appreciation for um, uh, for locals about this iconic animal and you know the reintroduction of, of bison has really just spurred a lot of interest locally um, there's Sundance Festival that the Kainai hold and there's some talk of having some teepees on Parks Canada's land near the summer paddock uh, we've been talking about a horse uh, mentorship program um, that Christina talked about um, north of the border. So lots of synergies and, and lots of appetite and, and enthusiasm. And I think I'll just leave you with, not only is this an iconic species on the landscape, I, I think it also brings people together. It, 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 this, this, this particular species has the ability to bring different cultures together and come to the table and talk cooperatively and collaboratively about uh, initiatives. And I think that really is its strength. Um, I find that uh, those we, we find out that oftentimes we share much more, we have much more in common than we than our differences, uh, and 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 uh, these reintroduction efforts really showcase that. So um, I'll stop there in the interest of time. Um, thank you again for having me, and and if you haven't come up to Waterton, um, please, I, I ha you have an open invitation to come up and visit uh, this summer once our borders are open and we're a little bit back to normal. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Sal. That was uh, terrific, and and you couldn't have uh, said it any better. Um, those were many of my uh, same sentiments. Um, I'm let's see. I'm going to finish off with just a couple thoughts um, here, um, and I'll just as background, I'll use some of these slides from uh, the Buffalo. Uh, treaty signing ceremony I participated in, uh, I think almost six years ago, six or seven years ago. Um, and again, you know, it's just that juxtaposition of landscape, people, culture, uh, that's all Glacier National Park in the background. Um, it's really been an honor to have had the opportunity to be part of this initiative as I've been the superintendent. I think so often, um, we think about um, in our partnerships how we, we, we end up sitting across the table, you know, bargaining or negotiating. And uh, the wonderful thing about the ANEA initiative is the fact that we're really more in a sitting around the table and thinking about what we have in common, how we work together, how we overcome some of the challenges. And, and let me tell you, you know, as federal agencies engaging in sort of uh, not only uh, working across jurisdictions, but even transboundary jurisdictions, there are a lot of details to work through. But what drives us forward is that spirit of collaboration and, and what, you know, what this really can represent uh, uh, for us. And, and as Christina said, you know, the 21st century thinking about um, conservation moving forward. And, and this is actually, you know, as I, uh, listen to Christina's talk. This is my knee 1.0 sort of mind map, and and uh, mind maps are these uh, visual uh, visualizations of of thought. Um, at the heart of it, I put the knee initiative, but 
I think it really speaks to some of what we've already heard, you know, that, that for me, thinking of conservation, culture, and community in and around the crown of the continent, um, and I can just sort of put in all the sort of benefits and issues that this INE initiative touches. And it really sort of, you almost realize that it's, it's you know, for us as the Park Service, it seems like it's a, it's a very sort of uh, 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 low hanging fruit from a conservation perspective, but, it, but even more so just how important it is from a community and a cultural uh, perspective. And that's what makes it, I think, transformational for me. That's what sort of energizes me about, uh, about this is, is, is that, um, you know, I think as, as our society evolves and, and starts thinking more than just the bottom line, you know, the dollars and cents piece, it's that triple bottom line. What's good for the environment? What's good for society? And what sort of makes sense economically? I think this is, this initiative captures all of that uh, in, in a very compelling way, and needless to say, in an incredible landscape that I think all of us who've been on this panel today are, are honored to uh, work with. So um, with that, I think um, we'll bring this um, uh, to a close, and uh, we'll take a look at um, uh, questions that uh, may have popped up in the chat. Oh, looks like we had some questions in the question and answer, but they've all been answered, I think. Um, and does anybody have questions that they'd like to submit in the uh, Q&A box or um, for the panel? Um, and, and I'll take the opportunity and, and um, open it to the panel or any, any closing thoughts uh, from any of the other panel members uh, that, that we heard from today. Oh, there's some Q and A's that have popped up. I just wanted to, um, again, thank everyone for inviting us to be on the panel. Um, amazing work, you know, I, I did kind of touch on that, that um, Dick Sanderville had, had talked about those seven calves that went to Salish Kootenai country and those seven calves were the ones that um, helped build the herd on the west side of the mountains and then were shipped to Elk Island. So it's so inspiring and, and just amazing that the Elk Island herd, you know, there, there are relatives that come from this area and, and they're making big changes all across the, the Northern America. So um, just so excited that Guy and I have their Buffalo and Waterton have their Buffalo and the dreams that we all talked about and, and pushed forward there. We're seeing that today and, and just knowing that our children will always have a knee is, is a huge and inspiring, just so mean, just so meaningful. Thank you. Yeah, I actually, if, um, that's great. Uh, thanks for, for that, Helen. Um, if I could ask the other panelists to uh, turn their video on, I um, hope this works just because we have some questions and, and uh, it'd be less uh, uh, stilted if, if everybody could be on. So we have a couple questions here. Um, uh, so question here about what is the biodiversity amongst bison in the area? And um, Christina, do you wanna Take that, I, I assume it uh, is referring to genetic diversity amongst the bison. Yeah, I wish um, Cynthia Hartway, my science program lead was on because she would probably answer for the next 20 minutes <laughs> about the genetics. Um, so actually in partnership with the National Park Service, WCS did a population viability analysis of 19 federal herds um, and included in that were a couple, I think one or two Canadian herds. Um, Saul may know better than I. Um, and so we have uh, completed that study that is now being um, 
put together and will inform the development of DOI's meta population management plan. But the other really exciting thing is we've leveraged that work to a deeper partnership with Parks Canada. And so we're starting to look at the genetics of a number of Parks Canada herds as well as First Nation herds. Um, and we were in early stage conversations about doing something similar with the Intertribal Buffalo Council, as well as the National Bison Association down here. Um, so the answer to the question is, um, it's a real concern because we got from 30 million animals to 500 to better understand um, the genetics of, that, of those animals and of those herds. And it's clear that there will need to be some movement of animals in order to maximize the genetic diversity of bison in North America. Um, and you know, part of the reason you wanna do that obviously is because climate change or any other kind of catastrophic event could really wipe out animals um, if the genetic diversity isn't there. And so I can't specifically say you know, what the gene pool in Blackfeet country is, um, but it's, it's been, and actually maybe Saul, maybe you can, um, but it's something that we're actively thinking about working on and, and in deep partnership with both federal, well, actually really mostly with federal agencies on that and parts of Canada. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, here's a question maybe for uh, Helen and Sheldon. Uh, the question, how is the bison herd, or maybe you should address herds, doing on the Blackfeet Reservation? Um, they seem to be really doing pretty good. Um, I was out there a while back. I just kind of took a ride because I get lonesome for them, being around them and stuff like that. So I actually drove through all of them, the Elk Island and the uh, uh, tribal herd down on the winter range. And they're, they, they're, they're, they're real good. They're, they got lots of babies. Yeah, so lots of babies. So. The, they're healthy. The herd is growing. Um, we had some come back from Oakland Zoo. Um, in that partnership. So um, yeah, they're, they're doing well. Yeah, I just might add, I think, you know, their, their viability when we have these extreme cold and winter events, um, you know, I think the traditional uh, stock growers, you know, always have to uh, manage winter kill of cattle uh, in the area, but I think, uh, I'm not sure I've ever heard of, win, you know, winter kill of, uh, that bison suffer from, from the cold. So, you know, obviously they're, they're, they're designed for it. So, um, maybe for Sal, a question here about any thoughts on how conservation can also help in advancing reconciliation efforts? Well, uh, I think the, um, you know, the, the answer is in the question. Um, we, we certainly are using uh, the bison rematriation work that we're doing here as a, a bit of a platform for all parts of reconciliation. And, um, you know, I'll just give you a bit of an example of kind of a vision I have uh, here in Waterton. Um, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn to say that um, some of my <clears throat> friends and colleagues and, and, and partners in the Blackfoot Confederacy um, there are uh, socioeconomic challenges uh, that, that they face. And in my mind, um, the bison form a platform to greater elements of reconciliation. And so one of the visions I have for these bison is some potential youth uh, camps uh, here in Waterton or in the uh, timber limit on, on uh, reserve land. Um, you know, I hear stories from Wilton Goodstriker and others who say that, you know, historically there used to be horse camps and, and places that youth could go uh, to uh, experience uh, the, the land and, and, you know, um, put it bluntly, stay out of trouble. Uh, and and um, uh, I, I really think there's real opportunity with the bison um, horse programs um, to foster that kind of work and and to me that's reconciliation you know that that is reconciliation efforts on the ground and and that's how these things manifest themselves um my my friend wilton goodstriker often tells me um it's easy to talk about reconciliation but what are you going to do and you know these rematriation exercises and um 
working collaboratively uh, on things like in Watterson, we now have a Blackfoot Cultural Center. Um, these are sort of uh, um, things that I like to do to help uh, reconciliation. Um, and oftentimes uh, it's the simple acts. Um, uh, you'll be surprised at the number of times I've heard, um, you know, Kainai elders and the Kani elders say to me, why can't you just put a okay welcome sign at the borders of Waterton? Um, so that when people come to this traditional territory, they're welcomed in their language and simply put. And uh, to Jeff's point, uh, the amount of bureaucracy to do something simple like that is tedious and uh, annoying and frustrating and angering. Um, but I, I have uh, committed to try to do something simple like that um, this, uh, this spring in Waterton. And so all this to say, it's, for me, it's those, just those little activities that, that lead towards reconciliation, because, you know, there's, in my mind, there's sort of two layers. We talk about it at a very high layer and reconciliation and honoring treaties. And then on the ground, I think for me, um, my best effort is sort of on the ground reconciliation. Thanks. Uh, and maybe I'll, um, just take a stab at, at two questions that reach out to sort of wanting to know how to view bison, whether it's in the park or otherwise. And um, the bison are not actually in Glacier National Park uh, free ranging yet. We hope that is soon, but certainly on the Blackfeet Reservation, if you're in Montana and if you're in Canada, the demonstration herd at Waterton, um, you will see bison on the landscape, but they just may not be within free ranging within the, the boundaries of the either park at this point yet. So that is a goal we are working towards. And uh, I think we're running out of time. I see Douglas is on and I think he's gonna close us out. So thank you everyone for your uh, work today and being on this panel. Yeah, yeah thank you all for those amazing presentations. Uh, there's a lot to be said, and I hope that we can continue this conversation. Um, I'm left with thinking about something that Helen said, that the any, the any said, I never left you. And I think that's really uh, a sign of hope to me. Uh, it kind of sums it up. Um, anyway, I hope we all can stay in touch and follow this up. I found it just an amazing experience. Uh, all the way around. And uh, I should mention that our next webinar will be on the 25th of May. And that one's going to be on the Hopewell Ceremonial Earthworks in Ohio. And we're March, making... 25th of March. I, you know, I get March and May mixed up all the time. Thank you. Uh, March, yeah. And, uh, and, and we are trying to bring back some of the Native American groups uh, that were uh, relocated to uh, Oklahoma be part of that. Listen, thank you all so much. I've really enjoyed this and I've really enjoyed meeting you and I want to meet you all in person someday. Okay. So when, when that's possible, you can expect me to be knocking on your door. Uh, so with that, thank you all so much. This was just an amazing experience and full of information. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful day. And uh, it's getting warmer. We've got a vaccine. We've got a new administration and we have hope. See you soon, I hope. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.